I want to thank you for joining us all this morning for our webinar. We're really grateful that you've chosen to spend some time with us as we discuss real-time environmental monitoring for your hybrid world management platform. In these pandemic times, data center outages, outages and IT performance issues have been on the rise. Facilities have seen a 45% reduction in on-site operations staff, as well as a 42% reduction in scheduled maintenance of equipment due to COVID. It's no wonder then that 95% of companies are looking to make investments to improve their remote monitoring and management capabilities. This morning's presentation will take a look at how you can maximize the effectiveness of your monitoring investment. This morning, we're joined by Cam Rogers and Andrew Graham. Cam is the Director of International and Western U.S. Sales for RLE Technologies. For more than 19 years, Cam has been responsible for developing and training channels to market for RLE's products and working directly with end customers in critical facilities around the world to design site monitoring, integration and leak detection systems to help solve the dilemma created by the convergence of protocols, and more recently, to help reduce costs by identifying and resolving airflow issues. Cam's goal is to ultimately help customers quickly identify issues that may lead to damage and downtime. And Andrew Graham is the director of DCS at CEG. He has more than 30 years of consistent success in consulting, designing, and supporting data center solutions to all industries, as well as federal and state government and higher education. Andrew is a proven leader that keeps up on best practices and codes for data center and mission critical facilities and knows how to apply these methods to unique environments to develop sound solutions. Under Andrew's direction, teams have completed data center migration, consolidation products, and new builds in hundreds of facilities. Over the last few years, Andrew has led engineering teams through energy assessments, optimization, and monitoring and management upgrades, impacting millions of square feet of data center space. And we will take a quick look at our agenda here. A thorough understanding of data center is crucial to winning the hybrid management game. Cam and Andrew will begin their presentation with some insight into what you need to know to really understand your data center needs. They'll walk through the six W's of data center management. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So I'll talk about how these concepts can be leveraged to help you make more informed decisions. And Cam and Andrew will share their personal real life examples of how they've applied these principles to solve problems for their customers. Finally, we'll touch on some specific products we offer that help improve real-time monitoring and integration into your hybrid management platforms. As always, we've allocated plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. By default, your audio is muted so Cam and Andrew can have the floor. During the presentation, as you have questions, please use the chat feature to submit your questions. You can submit them through the Common Everyone chat or if you prefer, you can send them privately directly to the RLE Technologies user. I'll collect all of your questions and ask them with Cam and Andrew at the end of the presentation. And at that, I'll turn the presentation over to Cam and Andrew. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, now Cam and I are gonna go through a few issues that really expose the need for real-time monitoring. The complexity of the hybrid data center model elevates the need for a tool set that can bridge management across our new hybrid model that is rapidly proliferating in these pandemic times where we now need more details of the environment, whether the assets are in our facilities, a colo or a cloud vendor's real estate portfolio, the responsibility of our applications and their supporting infrastructure still falls in our hands. So the need for real-time information about the environment and where we have available capacity is now more complex. So real-time monitoring that can provide us details to make informed decisions has become more crucial no matter where our applications and data reside. We also know that mid-range humidity inactivates the SARS coronavirus at all temperatures as shown in this chart you see on the right. And positive pressure also helps keep viruses out so many are now looking to expand monitoring humidity and pressure in mission critical as well as healthcare facilities. The complexity of the new hybrid model has caused many to throw their hands in the air and start looking for more resources to throw at this management problem. But the reality is more effective management of our resources is what is needed. Right, Cam? 
Yeah, that's exactly right, Andrew. You know, it all starts with those first steps towards understanding your infrastructure. Um, if you haven't already done it, you need to discover all the existing sensors, both on-site and off-site, and understand what signal types are available for integration into a management system. Uh, this also includes understanding what uh, exactly what outputs or protocols are available for integration of all the critical equipment that you might have. Uh, the next step is to identify exactly what sensors may need to be added to provide the information that's required to make those educated, proactive, even predictive decisions. Um, in today's world, localized alarms just aren't enough. The days of the sneaker reports or putting on those tennis shoes, walking around a site with a clipboard uh, just to take the readings really should be behind us. And getting information to the right people is critical and the foundation of site monitoring. Um, it doesn't need to be an expensive endeavor. You can easily add managed middleware appliances, such as RLE's Falcon FMS, that provide a direct alarm notification and easily aggregate all the sensors and information from critical equipment into that single pane of glass. And then as budget permits, incorporate a more comprehensive, maybe intuitive building management or DSIM solution. Uh, just make sure whatever you start with, it is scalable. And then once you have the right uh, pieces in place, hybrid world management can certainly be accomplished. Well, you'll probably all feel like a detective sometimes when trying to figure out what's running in your environment, how your environment is performing and how much capacity you have left. But do we have a Sherlock Holmes magnifying glass available if we ask you how many servers you have? We find that most are still toolless when asked this question. Do you know how much capacity you'll need for your next IT project? or how much you'll have six months from now or further out in the future. Do your bosses and users tell you about the outages today? Do you know what power consumption is or where ghost servers may reside that are consuming some of that power? Have you been able to pinpoint hotspots uh, in your data center floor or interruptions along your power chain? Most of us, unfortunately, are still re living in a reactive world but the expectation of us is that we're proactive and soon moving to predictive aided by artificial intelligence. Well, you first need to figure out where you stand on this management hierarchy to start trying to improve. Now, data center infrastructure management tools have been at a critical crossroads since Gardner Research abandoned their inclusion in the magic quadrant market sector, and also since many users now have adopted the hybrid data center strategy that includes a mix of on-site, hosted facilities, and cloud-based applications. Uh, the result of this is that in this new complex environment, the model elevates the need for a tool set to bridge management across a new hybrid model and a solution that provides environment details regardless of where the assets are at, at our facilities or if they're at a vendor's location. It um, also elevates the need for real-time information about the environment where capacity is more complex and to provide details that allow for in informed, proactive, predictive decisions which are going to be critical to your success. Uh, but as you already know, the responsibility of the applications <clears throat> excuse me, and the supporting infrastructure resides in your hands, regardless of where the equipment resides. That's right, Cam. And let's face it, the hybrid world has caused confusion. And here's more of the issues it has caused. Devices and applications are being spread across locations with more third-party resource dependence, which will continue to rise with COVID-19 and the pandemic causing restrictions to both non-essential and essential businesses. And much of the environment is now software defined, giving us a more limited understanding of infrastructure status, power, space, and cooling capacity. This leads to your staff's time being wasted, causing frustration and low morale, since it's often not clear what, what's, what they're doing and they have to redo a lot of the work. Our energy and management costs are also going up while our budgets are being reduced. Lots of time and resources are being spent, but it's not really clear what difference we're making sometimes. We no longer always know what is effective when a problem occurs. So how can we win the hybrid world management game? Uh, before that can even happen, we need to best manage what we already have to prevent interruptions that might result in downtime. Only then can we determine where we have capacity, where to best do rollout to support new application. Um, solving any problem is gonna be easier if we take a kind of a detective's approach to solve that mis mystery and understand the who, what, where, when, why, and how. 
Only after we answered those questions can we gain fundamental knowledge of the whole situation so we can make informed decisions. Andrew and I are now going to approach these questions, but arrange them into an order that might be a little bit more appropriate. Andrew? Well, Cam, we should probably start with the why when trying to investigate how real-time monitoring can help. As understanding why we need capacity to support a new business offering drives us to develop a game plan to address it. We also need to understand all of our objectives. For instance, why we need to improve productivity, why we're trying to reduce costs, why we're trying to ease deployment and management. Understanding why we need to eliminate the risk of surprises helps to find the aspects we need to cover the other five W questions Cam mentioned, the what, who, where, when, and how. Think of the adage, business requirements drive IT requirements, drive facility requirements. For the answer of every why question to help us, every measure needs to lead us to a defined action to result in a documented improvement. This chart you see at the, the bottom uh, provides an example of the documented results our improvements must deliver. The first one, uh, an increase in set point temperature needs to result in lowering our energy expense. If the raise in the set point increases IT fan speeds, we may not get the desired result of lowering operating costs that we were looking for. Secondly, finding stranded capacity must result in maximizing capital expenditures we've already made. Lastly, uh, and, and these are just examples, reducing false and nuisance alarms has to result in lower labor costs and allowing our staff to repurpose its focus to optimization. Cam and I are gonna be going and reviewing some case study examples as we present that emphasize the importance of understanding the fundamental answer to each of these six W questions throughout this presentation. This first case exemplifies the importance of understanding all stakeholders' answers to why. For an adhesives manufacturer we were working with, understanding why different stakeholders needed different monitoring and management for a UPS upgrade that supports their PLC control room helped us design the right solution to their issues. The operations staff told us they needed Modbus support to their BMS, but also to light a signal on their control room display board. Their IT and network staff needed SNMP alerts of when they were going on battery and backup power and back to um, the UPS. We, we resolved this by installing an SNMP card in the UPS. RLE's FDS PC protocol converter and a 24 volt relay to light the signal off the standard management and communication options available uh, for the small UPS we implemented. In addition to understanding why we're adding capacity, improving productivity and reducing costs, it's critical to understand why we had an outage, failure or loss in production. In this survey you see here conducted by Ponemon Institute, they determined that if we had alarm monitoring with direct notification, we could have timely identification for 66% of the leading causes of downtime. If our tools become more effective in alerting the correct resources and giving them actionable sound recommendations on what to try to resolve the issue, we can reduce human errors as well. So improving on the other 34% of issues causing failure and downtime in our environments today. Cost of downtime varies greatly by industry. Understand though that the average cost per outage across all industries is about $9,000 per minute and about $750,000 per incident. Do you know what your cost of downtime is? This will help you determine the ROI for upgrades to your monitoring, management, tool sets, and personnel. ROI analysis should absolutely be used to justify the monitoring and management improvements you need to make. There are also global concerns to under addressing why as well. Temperatures are rising with eight of the last 10 years being the warmest on record. Sea levels are rising and global weather disasters are escalating, ever increasing our potential for downtime. The 2020 hurricane season was one of the worst uh, in, for the record books. Data centers will soon consume about 4% of the global energy, which was only about 2% a few years ago. And if we consider all of the information communications technology, our global electrical demand is for technology, 
as uh, the Nature Research Journal did, we will grow to 20.9% of all power with IT by 2030 if we don't change the path we're on. Maybe today you don't see or have responsibility for the power cost to operate your data center, but with ICT being one of the fastest growing sectors for energy demand, you can't be sheltered from the rising impact of this cost much longer. It's been challenging enough to understand our energy consumption on our own premises, but understanding our power consumption can get very difficult when we try to understand our energy impact out in the cyber world and in the cloud. We need to work with our providers to fully understand our usage and what we can do together to reduce this impact. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, now, what keeps managers up at night? I guess more importantly, what keeps you up at night? Data center management criteria varies for everyone. It even varies for each of the who's that we're gonna talk about shortly. What it really comes down to is what assets, what applications, IT equipment, virtualization and cloud software are we looking to manage and converge. In this new hybrid world that includes multi-protocol, multi-platform, uh, DSIM, BMS, NMS, BAS systems or solutions, what is the best practice to support and manage everything from power to cooling to even the physical layer? Now, most every site being unique, you need to decide what is important to you. You need to decide what you need to monitor, manage, control, and what will provide you with access to the needed information to allow you to react quickly and resolve issues and proactively manage your infrastructure. So it's been said many times, you can't manage what you can't measure. Now certainly CFOs are gonna always wanna understand the return on investment for expenses made towards improved efficiency. And the only way to identify the impact that changes have is by incorporating appropriate monitoring systems and metrics to provide the needed benchmarks or a starting point before any changes are made. Only then can you truly understand the imp impact that those changes have had towards improved efficiency. Um, in regards to what can we monitor, most every sensor on the market has the option that allows it to be integrated into a monitoring or management system. Uh, today, most critical equipment actually probably has more information available than you could ever use. So what metrics can we use? Um, two of the most popular metrics for site monitoring are power usage effectiveness or PUE or data center infrastructure efficiency or DCIE. PUE and DCI are, are similar metrics, but they're just basically inversely related uh, performance metrics. PUE is a measurement of how efficiently the data center and IT infrastructure, infrastructure utilizes its power with the PUE equaling the total facility power divided by the power that's used to power your servers, uh, the servers. A low PUE indicates a highly efficient data center environment and DCIE equals the power used for the servers divided by the total facility power. So it's just the reciprocal of PUE. And in this case, a high DCIE value would be most desirable. There's really no reason to calculate both PUE and DCI since they provide the exact same information. And from what I'm really seeing, it appears that PUE is becoming the de facto standard of the two for monitoring efficiency. Now, since every site is unique, PUE and DCI values shouldn't necessarily be used as a bragging right, as much as an internal metric to help identify the impact that the changes that have uh, been implemented have had towards improving efficiency. Certainly a site in Phoenix during the summer is not gonna be able to compete with the PUE values from a much cooler environment in Canada where outside air can be used for, the, for, for cooling. Um, and as you may already know, RLE's Falcon FMS can display both the PUE and DCA as a standard feature using up to 32 values to calculate the metrics. Um, there are other metrics such as carbon usage effectiveness, IT equipment utilization, but you really need to understand and decide what metrics are important to you and your organization. Cam is absolutely right. We need to measure against ourselves on improvements, which in my opinion makes PUE a sketchy metric to begin with, as IT improvements alone show a worsening PUE when ratioed to facility power. So we're much better off at looking at metrics that capture and embrace any efficiency improvement. Cam spoke with you about meaningful metrics and users wanting to get the information that helps them make informed decisions easily without effort. And that's why PUE has been popular. Total IT power and facilities power are fairly easy to calculate. 
Today, most of us measure temperatures, humidity, and some measure pressure and velocity to determine cooling and airflow needs. What most IT managers wanna see is cooling shown in KW demand, as they can then easily determine power consumed per rack and hence cooling needed per rack. Today, you see many of the cooling equipment manufacturers rating their equipment in KW, but we must look at the conditions needed for that rating. Also, will that rating drop over time? Corrosion and coagulation of water and refrigerant lines and productivity of older equipment we know goes down. At CEG, we determined that a new sensor was needed that could measure cooling enthalpy, which tells the whole story as the sensor measures the energy in the total air mass and software then converts enthalpy into cooling needed per watts, which is closest to the miles per gallon metric we've all been looking for in determining cooling needs for IT. We're using these enthalpy gauges and software to determine exactly how much cooling air handlers are producing and how much cooling they can deliver to each rack through raised floor tiles. This is an example of how real-time monitoring can take the guesswork out of the capacity you have and entering real values into your modeling and management tools allows you to make informed decisions from real actionable data. Upsite reported that the data center industry was to waste 140 billion kilowatt hours, about $18 billion on inefficient cooling and lack of airflow management in 2020. So we know there is much to be gained and saved in getting better at this now in 2021. You know, the biggest danger of not understanding what is, you may invest in the wrong solution. An example of this is we were working with a university who thought they should deploy an active rear door heat exchanger, except they didn't understand that their application capacity need was actually very static. Most importantly, their BMS didn't have the chilled water controls to take advantage of an active rear door heat exchanger solution. If they had had better communications between the data center infrastructure manager, facilities manager, the business user, and systems management from the get-go and had tried to realize that their data points from the test dev application, they would have realized that this application was static and didn't need an active rear door heat exchanger solution. So what do we do to, with the university to fix this going forward? Well, they now have processes in place to keep the various stakeholders involved and communicating through planning and testing to implementation and optimizing this production environment. Where we need to have capacity and where we need to monitor and manage issues continues to expand, which makes keeping track of where of all of our devices and supporting infrastructure is more challenging. So we need to develop and track a continuous process for looking where we can obtain capacity and where our performance is. The monitoring and management of where our devices and supporting infrastructure is has become more complex because it's no longer just a couple of data centers and communication closets. Add colos, clouds, IoT environments, and where we might run edge applications in the future, uh, adding that to our new hybrid mix. Can third-party resources such as cloud providers even tell us where our data is stored and where it is being processed? Depending on how important that cloud application is to your environment, what the cloud apps interdependencies are to the rest of your environment, and if we must know where that data is stored and processed to be compliant, determines how important knowing where third-party cloud data and processes are, and if we must have an audit trail for compliance, can the cloud provider document it and keep us informed? Proceed cautiously here. So far, I've actually seen many colo providers providing building management platforms to their users and giving them access, but I haven't seen this so much yet for public cloud deployments. Now here is a case example of where understanding the full spectrum of where there was capacity before trying to implement would have resulted in a more successful implementation into the production environment. We were working with a retail provider uh, that has a global presence and they couldn't figure out why they lost devices uh, in multiple racks when servicing their A-side UPS in their core data center. 
the client didn't know that some of the IT equipment only had single power supplies. Some of the device power cords were plugged both into the A side of the distribution. A firewall lost power due to an IEC power cord that was not properly seated in the outlet. And lastly, their third party IT managed services provider was plugging devices in to this production environment without understanding the redundant infrastructure. We resolved this issue by installing rack automatic transfer switches to address single power supply devices in the racks and implemented new processes with checks and balances that were put in place to address all stakeholders working together to understand the redundant power infrastructure. The stakeholders now work together to approve where equipment and applications can be installed to meet where the required redundancy resides so all equipment meets the desired objective for redundancy and availability. Thanks, Andrew. So in looking at the who question, in the past it was mostly who do we need to address within our organization to help resolve the problems? Or who can help determine capacity requirements? Um, who can help facilitate a rollout solution to increase capacity? The biggest concern was getting facilities and IT to share information and communicate. Um, it's always been hard enough getting IT and facilities sit down at the same table, but now we now also need to include service providers for the cloud, colo, MSPs, as well as our partners, clients, and vendors. Uh, we also need to understand if there's a problem, who should be informed and who should address it. Can we ensure that any alarms are routed to the right people in a timely manner? And who should focus on facility monitoring, IT performance, and making process improvements? They're the ones that are gonna best, be best suited to address the new application or rollout. Um, in the event of any tools providing conflicting information, which might be nothing more than a nuisance alarm, another consideration is who's going to confirm that there's an, actually an issue on site before everybody goes into panic mode. Um, certainly, heading out to site and resolve an issue in the middle of the night is never a good experience, especially if there's not even an issue to resolve. Uh, sometimes a person chosen to determine if a situation is critical is not always the best person to make that decision. For example, facility mon managers are going to have a different concern than an IT data center manager. And that leaves the stakeholder, uh, stakeholder or the person that is really held accountable for the damage or downtime responsible for poor decisions that are being made by others. So now the question that I need to ask you this, uh, right, ask you is this, do you feel that the alarm notification that currently exists on your site routes alarms to the right people or does it route alarms to the wrong people that can't necessarily resolve the issue uh, that they might learn about? Now that subject's a very common problem that I see regularly, and it can easily be resolved with adequate monitoring, appropriate monitoring. But now this case study kind of helps illustrate just how big a problem it can be. Um, I was working with a site and the uh, data center manager contacted me and, and the biggest issue was that they had a managed service in their building that was responsible for managing all alarms. So all alarms were routed to the managed service. And uh, there was really no differentiation between critical, non-critical, and this managed service was kind of responsible for figuring out what was important, maybe what was less critical, and then getting those out. And in that case, it, it really resulted in significant uh, delays. And certainly, depending on the nature of a problem, those delays can result in damage and downtime that might be irre irreversible. So what we went ahead and did is we installed the Falcon FMS and provided uh, that granular monitoring and direct alarm notification for the data center manager. So he pulled all the sensors that were going directly to facilities into the Falcon FMS. He went ahead and uh, uh, set those thresholds, who got notified, how they got notified to the conditions that he was specifically concerned about. And then he went ahead and uh, passed that information back up to the, the management company, the facility management company via um, a common protocol, SNP Modbus or BACnet. And what ended up happening was within a couple of weeks of them installing the system, he actually got notification of a, an alarm condition on site in the middle of the night. He got out the site, resolved the issue and got back home. And he said a couple hours later, he was notified of that issue by the management, the facility management company. Now, had he waited that time, uh, at that time and not been aware of the issue and resolved it as quickly, it could have caused some serious damage on site. 
Well, that's really great to hear, Cam, that they're, they've gotten proactive and that they were able to address something before it came a, ser a serious issue. And some say timing is everything, of course. Well, certainly timing is important when we need to develop support infrastructure for our new applications. Too many still think about when they need space and infrastructure after their application is ready and IT equipment is on site to be put into the production facility. Don't just think about when you need equipment available and running to implement an application. Make sure that you actually work back from your required go live date to cover all resources needed for each step of the implementation. Make sure you allot time for planning, acknowledgement, and approvals in your processes. Most plans leave out the critical issue of allowing appropriate time for approvals, and then we get out of whack. Develop a monitoring and management workflow cycle like this one that you see here on the right to help you with planning, scheduling, and performance evaluation, allowing you to continuously develop and improve the management and optimization of your hybrid world. Also important is the when an incident or problem occurred. When was it reported? When was it resolved? And what was our total time to resolution of that issue? I'd like to know where our audience is in regards to being reactive, preventative, proactive, or predictive to incidents occurring. How many would deem their organization reactive, preventive, or proactive to when incidents occur? How many have advanced actually with a little artificial intelligence to predictive management addressing issues before the incidents occur, like Cam was talking about? What our industry says is most are still reactive to incidents occurring. When also becomes important on the timing of data getting entered and what values you're using. Nameplate, budgeted, derated, or actual values. Consider that ITAM, the International Association of Information Technology Asset Managers, determined that when we manually collect data values, we're only 85% accurate. Well, 85% sounded like a great test score when we were all back in school. But if we're making decisions on 15% bad, incorrect data, what is the impact of that on our decision making? In many cases, no data would be preferred to inaccurate data. Consider this example we show here on the right on power draw. Collecting real-time actual power draw, we determined that we could populate this rack with 14 servers without stranding any power. With 70% derated budget values that you see in the middle, we were only able to populate the rack with 11 servers. And on the left, if we build to nameplate, we only populate this rack with eight servers and we strand seven and a half amps or 1.5 kW per rack. We'll multiply that out across a whole data center of racks and we're burning a lot of energy and money that would pay for our improvements. So when is the right time to make a decision? Uh, the answer to that is always going to be before it's too late. Now, unfortunately, I see uh, I've, you know, a lot of sites that I've been in. Um, I get out there and identify issues and threats. And unfortunately, decisions aren't made in a timely manner. I was out at a, a pharmaceutical company, did a site survey. And they actually had some utilities up on one of the upper floors and uh, that consisted of a number of valves. And I identified no, no less than, I, I think it was 12 valves that were leaking. And um, the managers knew there were issues and they knew they needed to get leak detection. But they, uh, site managers uh, felt that, well, these, these leaking valves have containment underneath them, they have drains, so it's not that big an issue. We'll contain it and then water will basically channel where it needs to go. Um, so what ended up happening, we put together a formal quote to put leak detection in to identify the threats if they became more serious issues. And the expense of approval was not really a priority until a black water pipe actually ruptured above offices on one floor and that, that uh, black water actually ended up raining down through those offices and then the next floor down um, actually damaging some blood analysis machines valued at about a million dollars each, uh, literally causing millions of dollars worth of damage. Um, what we ended up doing was we installed a, a cost-effective solution um, and, and, and what I really recommend is, is start, something's better than nothing. Start small, at least get something in place. And then as budget uh, allows, go ahead and, and um, add more to it. 
you know, certainly any system that you look at, you want to make sure you're avoid, avoiding any kind of reoccurring costs. You want to go ahead and next year when budget allows, instead of putting good money into just keeping the system running, use that money to enhance the system. And then certainly make sure that each step that you take can easily lead towards that next step. Now, this case study kind of helps illustrate just how important the when really is. It also resulted in something that doesn't usually happen, whereas the person holding up the process that was directly and personally affected by their delay in making a decision that would allow others to get proactive. Now, you should always keep in mind that the costs of damage and downtime don't just include the hard costs for repairs. Uh, employees are already short on time in a day. Redirecting their efforts to resolve issues that could have been prevented certainly impacts productivity, uh, impacts the morale, it even impacts attitudes. When customers don't have access to what they expect to have access to, it might even impact their confidence, which might even result in lost customers. So how do we start? In looking at the how to expand and add capacity, the how has more options to consider in this new hybrid world, which really does add to the complexity of it. In addition to how are we gonna add more capacity on site, other considerations now need to include, how do we add capacity at the colo? How do we provision more cloud capacity? How do we best utilize experienced professionals? Um, before you can really begin to consider how to expand capacity, you need to understand the factors that that might impact that growth. And then all, uh, although every data center is somewhat unique, we can certainly learn from others and look at the types of events being experienced to address them before any expansion or changes to that capacity. Uh, a study that was report, uh, by Emerson reported that 84%, more than 84% of the issues dealt with by data center professionals could easily be resolved with real-time monitoring. Real-time monitoring can help identify power and cooling issues. It can help prevent hot spots. It can even alert us to water events before they might become catastrophes. Real-time monitoring with direct alarm notification to the people that can resolve the problems will resolve issues before they reduce performance, before they impact expansion or reduce existing capacity. It really doesn't make much sense to consider expansion if you aren't best managing the resources that you already have. Now there are numerous options available when it comes to sensors to so make, sh make sure you're doing your homework and not lock yourself into something that's proprietary or, or doesn't provide the needed, needed functionality today or tomorrow or in the future. When it comes to alarm monitoring, notification, integration solutions, you wanna make sure that you have the signals that will easily integrate with not, without needing to replace products as your budget allows for a more comprehensive solution. Um, ideally, any sensors that you use at the very least are going to have a digital dry contact or an on-off type signal. Uh, it's basically a summary alarm that tells you there's an alarm condition or not. So in this case, something is better than nothing. Um, sensors with a dry contact might include sensors such as magnetic door sensors or motion sensors or smoke detectors or, or current sensors, airflow, even summary alarm from a, a critical equipment or even uh, spot water leak detectors. If you do want more uh, intuitive information, analog sensors or a sensor with a value might be more beneficial. Most common types of analog sensors might uh, provide a four to 20 milliamp output or a zero to five, zero to 10 volt DC output. When integrated into a monitoring system, values from analog sensors allow you to determine what those acceptable thresholds are and what limits need to be reached before an alarm condition occurs. Uh, these types of sensors allow you to look at back at historical information for analytical purposes and identify trends that might need to be addressed. They also provide an ideal way to benchmark conditions before any changes are made on site to understand what impacts any changes being made have had towards improving efficiency. Now, always keep in mind that RLE offers a broad range of sensors that can help provide a comprehensive picture of the site uh, and even equipment conditions. Um, most new equipment that is being sold today, such as gen sets or computer room air conditioners or computer room air handlers, PDUs, UPS systems, they provide in some cases more information that's needed, as I mentioned earlier. Even if you have older equipment, it might make that might offer like a Modbus RTU, which communicates over an RS-45, and maybe your management system may not easily accommodate that protocol, 
look for protocol, uh, flexible protocol converters, such as our, LEs, our FDS PC uh, protocol converter that accommodates numerous protocols and devices with a single appliance. There's no need to use a protocol converter that only translates a single device. And also, even equipment with limited information can easily be retrofitted with sensors to provide you with information that you need. A crack unit, can, you can add temp sensors, humidity, airflow, power sensors, the uh, um, uh, list goes on, but to add intelligence and you can be able to pull information that you may not already have available from some of the older equipment. PDUs, you can incorporate branch circuit monitoring and identify the loads on each circuit and set those thresholds, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Uh, you can certainly make your racks smart by adding temp, humidity, airflow, even power monitoring at the rack level. You just need to understand what information is needed to allow you to best manage your infrastructure. Now, another subject that we need to discuss when looking at incorporating a more comprehensive site monitoring is the subject of wired versus wireless. Now, certainly wired solutions, historically, they really have been the only option. Still see a lot of people holding on to it and saying that's the only way to go. Uh, there are uh, much more uh, costly installation expensive running copper throughout the site. You also have the cost of copper itself. Uh, it is going to be a much more rigid installation, not as flexible. So as you need to move something, it's going to be a little bit more labor to do so. Now, we've developed the wing wireless products and, and certainly the, the, the right wireless products are really now becoming very widely accepted. We've had great success with our wireless products uh, because what we've done is we focus on the secure aspects by going with radio frequencies as opposed to uh, uh, an IP-based system. It help, really helps eliminate the potential for somebody to use it as an access point. Because we're using unidirectional communication, you can't open up a handshake and actually use it again as an access point. Uh, the wireless systems don't require numerous IP addresses uh, and the maintenance of all those routers around the site. Because we are using a, a 900 or 868 megahertz frequency, the sensors communicate directly with the manager and the manager resides behind your firewall, so very secure that way. Uh, the transmission distances and what we're seeing there is they're going to re require fewer report, uh, repeaters, so that's less hardware to manage and maintain. And we're also seeing battery lives with our products upwards of uh, really 12 years at this point. And, and honestly, that's uh, really not, nothing like it on the market that's providing that kind of functionality. In RLE, and I encourage you to kind of take a look at our website, go into the wing wireless section. We have a whole section based on uh, covering all the different sensors that we offer uh, to help you really hit, get that big picture of what's going on within your facilities. So when considering how, it's not just how we'll add capacity or improve, like why we need to understand how we had a failure, a loss of communications or a reduction in productivity. How was there an IT or facilities equipment failure? How did our staff respond? Did they fail? For our case example on how we made, how made an impact to an issue and a failure, I was working with a financial services company that was getting high temperature alerts on equipment deployed at a colo facility. The COLA went out and checked the rack and insisted that the client must have a faulty or non-calibrated sensor in their IT equipment. So the client went out and visited the COLA facility and found that the COLA was only measuring the air temperatures at the supply perforated tile, but that was per the COLA's SLA. But there was an adjacent cage that had their exhaust air aimed at the client's cold aisle. Well, the COLA, of course, said they'll work with the client to address it, even though the SLA only said they were responsible for the supplier attempts to the perforated tile. Ultimately, the re resolution is the COLA has since changed their policies for clients occupying cages on rack orientation and containment. The client uh, installed their own rack inlet and exhaust temperature sensors in the facility so they would always know what's going on and being alerted to issues in their racks. Now Cam will actually highlight three product lines RLE offers to improve real-time monitoring and integration into our hybrid management platforms. So there's no doubt that identifying those threats before they become serious, um, it's really imperative. And now since 1984, RLE Technologies have been providing solutions to address and overcome many of the problems that were discussed today. 
Since Arly products are engineered and designed to be both standalone with direct alarm notification and get alarms to the right people who can actually resolve the issues that have been identified, and also integrated solutions that pass aggregated information to a more comprehensive BMS, NMS, or DSIM uh, system, they can easily be used as scalable solutions. In addition to Arly's comprehensive Seek leak, uh, Seahawk leak detection products, Arley also offers a single source solution to be able to provide many of the other sensors that you may need, may need to accomplish effective site monitoring. Our Falcon wired and wireless systems uh, really uh, help solve the uh, dilemma of providing visibility to equipment and even existing sensors wherever they might be located in this hybrid world. They also ensure that the right people are aware of conditions and all the information can easily be integrated into another management system to allow for those educated and informed decisions. Um, if the hurdles you're facing include protocol translation, our Raptor integration products might best suit your needs. I strongly encourage that you spend some time on our website, review Arlie's products offering, and even watch some of the previous webinars that recorded that are now posted on our site for additional information to ensure that you're using all of the tools that are available to you. So in wrapping up, we hope that we have demonstrated that although we're not trained as detectives, Taking this Sherlock Holmes approach, answering the six fundamental six W questions of why, what, where, who, when, and how, allows us to solve the mystery, to understand the capacity and processes needed to resolve issues and provision additional capacity as we build, manage, and operate our new hybrid world. Monitoring is the foundation for all of our management and optimization tools, including building management systems, building uh, automation services, data center infrastructure management, help desk, IT asset management, and energy management services. So we must recognize what monitoring is still needed for all of our tools, what we need to know, uh, what monitoring we've already got. Can existing monitoring we have be integrated into all the tools where this data will help, or are protocol converters needed? Don't waste valuable funds and resources on deploying monitoring for each stakeholder's tool. Can we consolidate the management suite as well? Should we try to get onto a single pane of glass? Is a single pane of glass gonna be too congestive and complex or even feasible for managing our new hybrid world? We must determine if we need additional monitoring and if the monitoring is calibrated, accurate, and real-time enough to integrate this data into our suite of tools so that we can effectively plan, model, operate, manage, maintain, and optimize our hybrid world. So we wanna thank you all for your attendance. Thank and, you uh, so much, guys. Oh, sorry, Andrew. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I was, sorry, Andrew, I ran you right over there. Um, so we do have a, a few questions to answer this morning and uh, we want to thank you for spending your time with us and as we answer questions please note that cam and andrew both have all their contact information right there on the screen you, they would encourage you to reach out if you have any more specific questions than the ones that have already been submitted uh, they are always available to talk to you via email or phone um, and as you can tell based on their presentation this morning this is something they are very passionate excited and knowledgeable about so um, at that, guys, I'm gonna jump into our questions. Uh, first one we have is uh, the tool that, show, that you showed that measures cooling capacity of air handlers and for perforated raised floor tiles. Is that something that's available for purchase? I'll take that one, Jenny. Um, so the uh, cooling enthalpy gauges and, and our software controller is actually called Mass Airflow. Uh, we, we are early in the process, but uh, we have done a couple of proof of concepts. It is pat patented technology and it's working well. Uh, and we are using this tool uh, both as a service uh, and, and as a solution uh, for clients. Uh, we found you know, it definitely helps to you know, have us on site initially for the implementation uh, to determine you know, how much the air handlers are uh, producing and uh, to you know, evaluate uh, the, the tile locations and the IT rack needs uh, and, and make the appropriate adjustments uh, from the measurements we, we, we make. But 
some clients absolutely are interested in deploying the, the solution uh, so that they can continue to, to monitor uh, the, the capacity coming out of their air handlers in particular, uh, as well as having that bolometer like device that we have to go around from tile to tile. So the answer is both. We're, we're providing it as both a service as well as a, a, a solution that the client can use to continue to monitor and optimize their environment. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, it looks like the next one is probably uh, targeted towards Cam. Uh, Cam, you talked about the wing wireless sensors um, and a 12 year battery lifetime. Is that really the expected battery lifetime? And is there a way to monitor how much battery life is left in those sensors before they fall offline? Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the, the battery life itself, there's a couple of factors that come into play. Now, the full operating temperature range of the sensors of the wing products, we're looking at really negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit to about 185 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature will impact that battery life. Um, if we're looking at something comparable to a kind of a room temperature, uh, where we are the specifications as far as our engineering specs uh, do claim that we're gonna have about a 12 year battery life. Now, if we're looking at something that might be more extreme at running at 13 to negative 13 or closer to 185, that could certainly impact the battery life and it might be around five years. So it really comes down to the environment that these uh, are being used in. Um, now, I do know that we have sensors here in our offices at RLE that have been up, up and running since the, the release of the wing product four years ago that are still reading pretty much uh, a full battery. So, um, you know, that information is available through the web interface. You, when you log into the unit for each sensor, you can actually see the signals or the battery strength. You can set alarms based on that battery strength and you can even set uh, uh, a counters. So after eight years, let's go ahead and, and start swapping out batteries or 10 years or whatever you decide you wanna do. So if you had a couple hundred sensors, it's not that you need to be changing. You're not doing it all within you know, a couple of weeks hoping to beat the clock, so to speak, at the end of that uh, battery life. But you can actually schedule that so you get an alarm notification or a reminder letting you know that uh, it, it might be time to get out there and start thinking about replacing batteries. Thanks, Cam. Uh, this one's, uh, the next question is related-ish. It's also about environmental sensors. Uh, do they need to be calibrated and will they require calibration? Okay, great question. Uh, the elements that we're using for those sensors are calibrated and tested by the manufacturer before we get them um, and incorporate them into our final assembly. Um, we're not doing any kind of separate conversion when, uh, that we could be losing those precisions. Uh, we're, we're reading the results digitally directly from the sensor and the results should be the exact same results that our manufacturer saw when they did their initial uh, calibration and testing. Um, even if there is some sensor drift, which has not been a problem, we do now also have the ability to adjust the offset uh, so you can kind of dial in those readings a little bit. Excellent. Uh, next question, how many devices can I connect to an FMS and how are they connected to the FMS? Okay, I'll take that one again. Um, what we've done with the FMS is it, it is very scalable. So again, it's designed to accommodate third party sensors that might already be on site. Depending on the option cards that are added, we can have as many as 104 hardwired inputs. Um, if we're looking at integrated devices, UPS or gensets or crack or cry units, uh, we can actually have as many as 32 appliances connected, communicating via SNMP, Modbus or BACnet protocols. And then with those 32, we can have as many as a, a thousand OIDs, instances or registers split between those 32 uh, so we can pull quite a bit of information in so it's really a matter of as it's being configured and you're mapping out the system you identify which points are important to you that are worth mapping and then you might you know if you wanted to pull a thousand points out of one device you can do that if you wanted to split the the, the, the thousand values between 32 you can do that as well uh, another nice thing about it is because of what we've done with the uh, units being able to integrate into others if I had one FMS with 32 devices, well, that would act as kind of one 
device, I could have 32 of those devices all communicating back to another FMS. So I, now I'm in an essence, I could have, you know, visibility to over, a, you know, over a thousand locations uh, just within a couple of clicks. I'll add to that too, that, um, you know, that's one of the, the unique things we've seen with RLE and uh, it's very appealing to a lot of our clients is that you can nest the FMSs and manage, you know, thousands and monitor thousands of devices uh, without annual software licensing and fees. Thanks, guys. Uh, looks like we have, as we get right up on our one hour time frame here, we have one more question. I think you're both going to like this one because I'm sure you both have experiences with this. Do you often see cases where the monitoring is added after an outage or a failure, like in your presented leak detection case? Uh, Andrew, you want to start? I'll finish. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I wish I could say it, it wasn't the case, but unfortunately, you know, as much as fear and doubt sells in this industry, uh, unfortunately, most of the implementations tend to occur after there's been a significant issue. Um, so I would say, you know, it's not that often that, it, uh, you know, you have uh, rain coming down on the decision maker's desk who is, you know, holding the uh, uh, the approval for a leak detection system, uh, but it's, you know, not really that different when they don't put in the proper monitoring and you see what happened with the, uh, you know, global retail provider. We were, uh, you know, addressing actually improving their redundancy and they found out how little redundancy they had in some cases on the IT equipment deployed at the rack level. That's kind of where they tripped up. So, you know, unfortunately, sometimes uh, it, it does take uh, an, an issue to people to really start addressing it. But that's kind of what we were covering in this whole presentation is that we need to get more proactive uh, and, and really develop the case uh, for our C-level to pull the trigger. Uh, you know, outages absolutely are escalating and rising in these pandemic times as Jenny started off, you know, mentioning that uh, we're all dealing with 45% reduced operation staff on site and 42% uh, delayed preventative maintenance. Well, that's absolutely causing some issues. And that's why, you know, Uptime Institute is uh, predicting that, you know, at least 50% of users are actually looking to make major improvements to their remote monitoring and management. So the best way for you to really accomplish that for your organization is to make that strong ROI case and really look at the cost of your downtime and put that into the case that you're going to make to your C-level management. Yeah, I can't really put it any better than the way Andrew just put it. I mean, he had covered everything that I really would cover. The, the, the bottom line is that, unfortunately, it is a very reactive world. And unfortunately, people wait for the damage to be done before they start thinking about what they can do so it doesn't have to happen again. And it just really comes down to having that visibility, doing what you can to get the, the, the monitoring in place to give you vis visibility, not only to identify those threats before it might cause damage or downtime, but to get the benchmarks in place so you can identify and understand what those uh, changes that you're making to your facility, the, the implementations you have, how that imp impacts efficiency. So you can, you know, that return on investment when it comes down to the CFOs, they really like to understand what the, their expenses and where that's going and having the systems in place before certainly gives you that benchmark to be able to justify that. Perfect. Thanks so much, guys. That does round out our questions. Um, from here, we have reached an hour. So again, we want to express our gratitude to each and every one of you for joining us this morning. Uh, we are recording this presentation, so it will be available within the next day or so on the RLE website. If you need to review any points, if you want to pass it on to any uh, partners, coworkers, uh, customers, we encourage you to do that um, along with all the rest of our webinars that are available there. Um, so again, thank you very much. Thank you, Kim and Andrew for your, your time this morning and for the effort you put into compiling all this information and sharing with us all. We, we really appreciate you. Thank you. I hope everybody found it informative and fun.
You're quite welcome. Thank you, everybody, for being part of it.